It's a pleasure to be here. I, I love Iceland and uh, I'm a great fan of the sagas. And uh, so it's, it's very nice to be here. So I'm going to talk today about things that I don't understand. So I hope that you'll, uh, I, I hope the questions are interesting. And I'll give you the fragments of things that we do understand. And so here's a, an outline of my, my talk. I'll, I'll try and mix some theoretical ideas with some very practical things. Um, but it's not going to be coherent because despite my title, I, that's why the tort is in there. I think we're a long way from having this theory. But, but we do have some, some hints about what, what should be in it. Um, I have to begin um, with current events uh, just because I think that's, at least if you're an American, you can't not be thinking about this right now. Um, I had a dream last night, I'll admit to you. I got in at about 3 a.m. Um, and so I was sleeping a bit restlessly and had this dream that, and, and by the way, so this is from the, the cover of The Sun who was pointing out that actually 16 years ago, The Simpsons had an episode in which they imagined that Donald Trump was, became president, ran up a giant deficit, and then Lisa had to become president to replace him. I have not been able to find the actual episode, but I gather that's the plot outline. So it is a bit, um, and you can see, you know, America, you can be my ex-wife. Uh, I think that's about the attitude he's going to take. Um, now, in my dream, though, I was mixed in with this conference because in my dream, it turned out that Jackie and her group, back about 16 years ago, had decided as an AI project to make a model of Donald Trump. And Donald Trump had actually um, helped them out by supplying his answers to what he would have done. But the cool thing was at this point, they could simulate Donald Trump perfectly. Um, so I woke up. It was a, well, it would be a nightmare, except that what's happened is actually a much worse nightmare. Um, now, back to technology and what I'm going to talk about today. Technology is something that's co-evolved with early humans. Uh, I, I particularly like this um, Stone Age rock carving. Uh, the guy with his little um, poles and his cool hat and his very big skis. Um, Tool use predates human beings by quite a lot. And I would argue, along with others, that um, actually tool use, tools in humans co-evolved. So technology isn't something that, it's not like humans got a big brain and then they suddenly understood how to use tools. No, these guys here were already using tools and we evolved a longer trajectory that involved a strong co-evolution between us and tools. Um, without technology, none of us would exist. For anybody that, that in Iceland, you, I, I don't think you would have to be too convinced of this. Um, Rob Boyd from the University of Arizona has a lecture on uh, the technology of the Inuit. And you see the remarkable cleverness that goes into these technologies without which it's very difficult to exist in a hostile climate. But if you, you think about it, actually, almost in any climate, People can't exist without using tools. You have to use tools at some level. And in fact, I, if I had more time, I could talk about the whole evolution of the human population. It's clear there's been a feedback between invention, which allows us to raise the carrying capacity for human beings, in particular by making, by agriculture and making agriculture more effective through time. And then increasing the population means more inventors, which means more invention, which accelerated growth so that we actually have had a super exponential increase in human population until about 50 years ago, uh, since Roman times. And um, so there's a, a strong sense in which I think without technology, we literally wouldn't exist. Um, I was influenced as a kid by Teilhard de Chardin, rather unusual Jesuit priest who, um, who envisioned technology, biology, and culture co-evolving to form a greater whole that he dubbed the noosphere. And, and I've had the feeling through my life that the technology piece of this, while technology is all around us, we use it all the time, we buy it, we talk about it, we think about it, we don't really, we don't really have a way of thinking about it. And, and we haven't exerted as much effort towards understanding as we have to evolution in biology and evolution in culture. Um, and as I started my talk, this is a field where the state of understanding is still anecdotal. The subject's dominated by economic historians. I mention a few of my favorites here. 
I love their writing, but you read these things, it's more or less history. They say, well, here's what happened with the steam engine. Here's what happened with the laser printer. And they give examples and they talk about the specifics of those examples, uh, but there's no broader theory about um, how they actually work. Now, there's another branch that I'll come back and say a little bit more later about growth economists that, that do things in a different way, but that's also, in my opinion, well, valuable, very limited. Um, now, so my thesis that I'm going to be talking about today is the idea that technologies are undergo Darwinian, um, Wallace-Darwin type evolution, where you, and the reason I say that is because they undergo descent with variation and selection. That is, technologies strongly inf that we have at this point in time strongly influence the technologies that we can make next. Uh, there's a lot of trial and error. I can say this with some experience, uh, having actually made the first wearable digital computer. Um, there was an awful lot of trial and error involved in getting something to work. Um, I'm one of the authors of a review paper on making an analogy between biological and technological evolution. Um, you might also want to see this paper, if this interests you, by Andreas Wagner and Rosen from 2014 discussing the similarities and the differences. I, I'm not going to go through this in great detail. Um, you know, they're driven by selection. They both result in diversity. There's incremental variation, temporal progression, purposeful function of units, but there's a lot of differences in the way things happen. And, um, and my remark in the bottom that I'll say something about at the end, I think through time the dividing line between um, technological evolution and biological evolution is going to become ever more blurred as genetic engineering becomes uh, increasingly more used and widespread and as digital technologies become more autonomous. Um, one of the reasons that technological evolution is harder to understand is because there's no sex. And sex actually makes biology, biological classification easy because it means that you end up with trees as the underlying classification scheme. But in biology, it, or, sorry, in technology, things are much more Lamarckian. Um, inventors take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and they mush things together in ways that are hard to track. And they even often deny the things that clearly did influence them because maybe they either aren't self-aware enough or have other reasons for that. And so, Unlike sexual reproduction, so which determines what happens with all of the um, larger animals, uh, where you get a tree, you get you get these um, you get a more complicated graph, and it's analogous to what's called horizontal gene transfer, which is the way bacteria reproduce. Where bacteria are a bit like inventors, they go along, they encounter each other, and they grab little bits of each other's genomes and splice them in so that a bacterial genome is not made in the very systematic way that that of a vertebrate is. And I would argue that in part because of this complexity and in part because we haven't focused on it, um, that the understanding of um, the way technology is involved is pre-Linnaean. So you probably know that Linnaeus, quite a bit before Darwin, uh, created a classification scheme it was a very empirical, descriptive thing. They, he just, they observed plants and animals very carefully, they wrote down characteristics, they grouped things together, and they created a tree, which uh, served as the basis, I would argue, for what Darwin did. With, without this classification scheme, Darwin would not have been able to think about, uh, to turn taxonomy into phylogeny by, um, realizing that this taxonomic structure reflected very deeply the evolutionary history of the biosphere. And, um, but in technology, we don't even have something like a Linnaean system. We have classification schemes that are constructed by patent offices, and the first tip-off that they're fairly arbitrary is that they're all different. Every country has a different scheme. Now, they are starting to standardize around something called the IPC, but it's constructed in an ad hoc way. Now, it may be that it can serve as a kind of a rough um, basis for, a, for a, a, an evolutionary theory, 
but there's quite a lot to do yet. <coughs> it's also worth noting that the data available is very different. In biology, people have been gathering fossils and trying to organize them for centuries now. And they're rich databases built on efforts by tens or hundreds of thousands of people. And, and a lot of thinking has gone into what these fossils mean, what those organisms were, <coughs> and how they, um, how, what their patterns of descent were. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm uh, fighting a, a cold. Um, um, in technology, in contrast, as I already said, we don't have a good taxonomy. We have at best an anecdotal ph phylogeny from the economic historians, but we do have other kinds of information. Like with technologies, we often have a very clear idea of what we want those technologies to do. We can measure quantitatively how they perform, and we can track that through time. So we can really think about the concept that technological evolution is a process of things getting better, or at least performance metrics going up, not, not to uh, impart too much of a value judgment on it. But we can, we can literally see in technologies the course of progress through time, which allows you to study something that you can't study in biological organisms. Now, as an aside, this is a much debated point. In biology, biologists generally don't even like to think about concepts like that, though I would argue that if you go back to the beginning of life, uh, over the last four billion years or so, there has been a pretty strong progression in the characteristics of the biosphere, and I might even argue in the performance characteristics of the biosphere. It's for its ability to um, uh, fix energy and process information, but those things are all really hard to measure, and uh, people actually get nervous when you talk about things like that because you think you're talking about some form of social Darwinism, which I'm certainly not implying. Um, but so there's a very different kind of science that, that is done as a result of the data being different. Now, one advantage we have in technology that I don't think has been properly exploited is that the simplest technologies are far simpler than the simplest organisms. In fact, one thing that makes it challenging is it's hard to define what a technology even is, because if you take something like a stone, I mean, a stone is just a stone, unless I pick it up with my hand and smash somebody's head with it, in which case it becomes a weapon, and now I can compare it to other technologies that are weapons. So um, uh, because of this, uh, in a sense, this almost creates a confusion in, in even defining what we mean. Um, that's actually something I've thought about quite a bit. I, it's not in this talk, but I, I, I've come to the conclusion that machines uh, and technologies, physical technologies, are, are ways of constraining uh, momentum. Um, but that's, that's a longer story I'm not going to get into, but you can ask me about it if you want. And by the way, you should feel free to raise your hand and ask a question while I speak. I'm very open to questions as I go along. Now, Complexity economics, the, this kind of funny fringe field that I'm a part of, um, is um, one of the things that I think we can offer is are alternative ways to think about growth. In particular, um, if you go back to traditional economics, the way they think about growth is in terms of production functions. So to a traditional economist, um, production, Y, is some... So is, is some function of things like labor, L, in capital C, with some coefficient. And then this coefficient in front, A, is called total factor productivity. In a very, very famous study performed in uh, the early, in the 50s, actually, Solo, took data and asked, well, how much of, of, of production can we explain from C and L? And what he found was the answer was not much. Most of the explanation has to come in variations in A, which, which <coughs> economists interpret to mean that it's really technological progress that's the main driver of economic growth and not good planning in the way capital and labor are allocated. And uh, so the lion's share is explained by this. Now, uh, someone like Paul Romer, who I mentioned, who's a growth economist, tackles this by um, postulating dynamics for AFT, but they're still thinking about technology 
is a number. So this number describes technology for the entire world. And I argue that we need to go beyond that. Um, we need to think about technologies and interacting and evolving ecology. And to understand economic growth, we have to get inside the black box and really think about what technologies actually are. So <clears throat> now I'm going to give you uh, two examples of how this can help us. And, um, and as I said, these are just little, um, uh, little snippets, really, of what I think ultimately needs to go into making a proper theory. And I'm now going to transition to talking about something that's quite practical. So this is, um, let, me, let me just talk you through this slide and explain the reasons why, as a, as a pol policymakers, need to be thinking more carefully about what's actually driving technological change and the fact that different technologies are different. Um, now, so what we're looking at here is a plot as a function of time. So these are years. So it's a fairly long time span. We plot the cost on the left-hand axis of generating uh, electricity measured in dollars per kilowatt hour. And, and in particular, this black curve here is the coal fuel price for electricity generation. So, so this curve is really it's just a cost of coal, but, but pre presented in units that relate it to electricity, um, the fuel cost is about 40% or 50% of the cost of generating electricity from a modern coal-fired electricity power plant. And so if you take a modern electricity power plant and you just look at how, how uh, this is just then the cost of coal reflected in the roughly two pennies that correspond to the cost that you're paying per kilowatt of electricity, kilowatt hour of electricity. Now, um, the striking thing when you look at this time series, it's about a 150-year time series, is that it hasn't actually gone up or down very much. It wiggles around, but once you adjust for inflation, the price of coal is pretty constant. You can show this by fitting a time series model to it. You fit a time series model to it, you get a random walk without drift. You can't reject that null hypothesis. Second technology is nuclear power. Each of these little red triangles represents the cost of the electricity from a nuclear power plant in, in the United States in the year where the nuclear power plant came online. And so what you see is during the, the lifespan of this data, if anything, the cost of nuclear power went up by a factor of two or three. Most likely, the lion's share of that cost is because um, people had concerns about the safety of nuclear power, and so it became more complicated to generate electricity with nuclear power because the safety standards went up. But that's not clear. That's the whole explanation. Um, now, in contrast, this green, these green dots, and now the axis is over here, because what we're looking at is the cost of solar modules. And so the way you think about the cost of solar modules is you look at the cost of making a solar module, that in, in this case, in dollars per watt peak. So in other words, if you can take that module and you just lay it out in the sun, um, what's the cost of a module that will generate one watt of electricity? And what you see is a very different looking behavior. So across the span of the data we plot, um, Relative to the others, the price is coming crashing down. It's got some fits and starts. You can see there's a plateau there, other places where it's really plunged. And, but in fact, if you look at uh, solar photovoltaic modules, the first uh, module was uh, commercially, well, not quite commercially, went to the Vanguard satellite. The cost is, is now a factor of 3,000 cheaper than it was then. It happens that same year, 1956, was the year the first British power plant, nuclear power plant, went online. And um, you cannot say the same thing for nuclear power. This, by the way, is the projected cost of the Hinkley Point nu nuclear power plant uh, that's projected to be built in Great Britain. Um, politics are still a little complicated because of the Chinese and the French uh, and the British uh, vacillations of the British government. But this is what the electricity would cost if they actually bring it in at the projection, historically, nuclear power has come in about a factor of three higher than projections. Um, 
But what you see is that solar, solar energy is actually becoming cheaper than nuclear power. And if this extrapolation that I made is correct, by 2050, it should be substantially cheaper than coal-fired electricity. Um, so, food for thought. Now, in fact, one of the things we've done is look at, collect time series like that for lots of different technologies, and look at how the rates of decrease of the cost change with time. So we make plots like this. We fit, we assume that prices are dropping exponentially, as they are roughly here. We fit an exponent, and we translate this into a percent change. So solar energy, for example, has been coming down at a rate of 10 to 12 percent per year throughout its history. So we, we take that number, we put it into a histogram. We did that for about 200 different technologies, including lots of things, oil, natural gas, various minerals, chemicals. And, and what we find when we do that is that most things live in this kind of Gaussian-looking center that's roughly centered around zero. It's not surprising in a way because when you think about it, we're adjusting prices for inflation. Most of the technologies in the economy are improving roughly at the rate of inflation because in a sense they're defining that rate of inflation. But then there's exceptional technologies like computer hardware or DNA sequencing that have been improving at dramatically faster rates in some cases for many, many decades now. So there's something fundamentally different going on with these kind of technologies. And photovoltaics, just for reference, are at 10%. At they're, they're out here toward the tail, but, but on the edge of that tail. Uh, I'll come back at the end of my talk, actually, to say something about robotics. Now, now how can we use this practically? So we began by... Um, well, we be, I won't even say how we began. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say, uh, I'll present a story for how to make sense of this in a simple way. Mo Moore's Law is something I think everybody's familiar with. But Moore's Law, in its original form, was something that was originally about the density of transistors as a function of time. That was what Moore's hypothesis was about. He basically said transistors will become more dense uh, such that the density um, doubles roughly every two years. And now, it then rapidly, though, came to be discussed in other terms, to be a statement about the speed of computers, about the cost of computers, and, and so on. So it immediately started being generalized. And in fact, we've seen that it, it's for these technologies that are out on the tail, most of the time, Moore's Law, from anything about here on out, most of the time, Moore's Law is not a bad hypothesis, Although, as you get toward the center, things get noisier and noisier. Um, now, there's actually another law that's been around longer than Moore's Law. It's due to this fellow, Theodore Paul Wright, very interesting guy. He, um, he was, he's part of a family. His, his two brothers are more famous than he is. One of them is Sewell Wright, who's one of the most famous evolutionary biologists. And the other brothers, I, I always forget his name, but I think it's Percival Wright, who is a, a, considered one of the founders of political science. Uh, he was a black sheep of the family. He went off to World War I and became a flying ace and, um, uh, and then came back after the war and was, was a key player in the aircraft industry. And 1936, he wrote his only paper where he pointed out that if you take a given kind of airplane, that the cost of that airplane drops about 20% every time the cumulative production of that airplane doubles. So the more we produce the airplane, somehow we get better at producing it so the cost goes down. And um, so, so you can write that in the form I've written it up there, um, where the cost, y, <coughs> is if x is the cumulative production, the cost is following as some power of cumulative production where that power alpha is typically around 0.3, although I'll question that typicalness in a moment. That, that was what was generally believed. Um, and at least for airplanes, that, tends, that is the number. And that translates into the statement I said that when cumulative production doubles, costs drop by about 20%. Now, 
Wright actually went on to become the head of aircraft production for the United States during World War II and, um, and actually used his own law to forecast what it was going to cost to produce planes because during World War II, the cumulative production went up dramatically uh, for all these planes. And so it was actually a very useful thing. Very large drops in cost were observed during the course of the war. Now, uh, again, if I were giving several lectures, I might go into the origin of Wright's Law. We have a paper trying to derive why Wright's Law should exist. And, um, and, he, and making a hypothesis, well, actually, it's something we derive from our model, which is that more complex technologies in the sense of more interacting parts that have to be coordinated should improve at lower rates, that is, have smaller val values of alpha than others. To be honest, um, I think this is about as good an explanation as exists, but I don't think it's a very good explanation. I think the essence of what's driving rights law still remains to be understood. Now, just to compare these things, in this plot we've got Moore's Law, so I took three different technologies, transistors, photovoltaics, hard disk drives, and ethanol, and we plot them through time. Uh, so you, you're, we're plotting now, this is a Moore's Law plot, so we're plotting the average unit price as a function of time, since the hypothesis is that the costs are dropping exponentially, then uh, we use a semi-log plot, and you see that you get roughly straight lines. And, you know, there's variations from them, but as these things go, an exponential fit is not bad. Now, you can plot the same data using Wright's Law. It requires more information because now instead of time on the x-axis, we have cumulative production. Actually, we have the logarithm of cumulative production. And <coughs> so, um, so we plot these same technologies, and you can see you get similarly good fits. In fact, perhaps these fits are a bit better. And now, how can this be? Well, it turns out, we discovered, that there's another regularity going on here, which is if you look at these technologies and you plot the production as a function of time, you can see that, uh, and actually this may be cumulative production, if you plot this as a function of time, you also see exponentially increasing curves. And as was originally pointed out by Sahal in 1987, um, if it's a kind of an obvious fact when you think about it, if production's expanding exponentially and costs are dropping exponentially, then if you just eliminate time from these two expressions, so you write cost as a function of cumulative production, then you get a power law, and now the, and the exponent of that power law is minus V over A. So you can relate these two exponents here. This is the one for the generalized Moore's law. That's the ex exponent for the increase in production, A, are directly related to this exponent alpha for Wright's law. And in fact, we tested that, and it works extremely well. Now, I, ha I have to tell you a strange story. Well, I don't have to tell you this, but uh, it's sufficiently strange that I sort of can't resist telling it. This, my postdoc, Bela Nagy, is the one who really drove this early work. He collected the data sets that I'm about to, or, or let's say, organized, like local high school students and so on, to help him collect this data sets. Uh, the Transylvanian, and um, uh, he, I have to, he got, he got very interested in this fellow Sahal, because it turns out Sahal just mysteriously disappeared in about 1989. That's he was around one day, and one day he wasn't there anymore, and you know there was no suicide note, nobody ever found a body, he just disappeared, and Bela went so far as to track his brother down and have a correspondence with him. Well, about two years later, Bela disappeared. So, um, uh, strange. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so it's a pity, though, because I thought he was doing some great work. And, uh, uh, well, who knows? Who knows? Um, now, so the question, can we use these laws that I'm just talking to you about, whose origin is not really well understood, to predict things. How, how, can, how well can we do, to go back to uh, this slide here, if you were the skeptic, and I, I had made this statement that it looks like by about 2050, um, photovoltaic electricity should be a lot cheaper than coal. 
Notice it's a log plot, so that, that's a significant amount in this plot. Well, is that true? I mean, this is just an empirical regularity. How do we know this isn't going to just turn around and plateau out? So our approach to understanding that from an empirical point of view, lacking a deeper understanding, is to um, uh, collect a lot of data. Bela and his team collected around data on 50 different technologies that were improving. And we had a, a first pass, in the paper above, <coughs> to try and then make predictions uh, and test whether, whether if we pretended to be in the past, would, would we have been able to reliably predict the future? Um, and let me just look at my uh, yeah, next slide here, just to give you, uh, explain what we did. We pretended to be at a given time in the past. We forecast each future date. So we forecast if we're sitting, we imagine we're sitting in 1980, we forecast 1981, 1982, 1983, 1984, all the way up to the end of the data set that we have. Um, we repeat that for all past dates. We score the methods based on their forecasting errors. Um, so that's what we did in the top paper. Uh, and then now we have this problem of when we do that, how do we compare the errors on all these technologies? How do we make sense out of this? Because at the end of the day, we didn't want to just make forecasts. We wanted to be able to give you a distributional forecast that would effectively tell you how good our forecast is. And we wanted to do that and test it so that we, we could have some confidence in it. Now, um, what Francois Lafond and I did was to go beyond, I'm not going to tell you about the earlier thing because it's a bit complicated, doesn't work as well. This, this works quite nicely. So we reformulated Moore's Law and Wright's Law as time series models. So what does that mean? Well, we take the logarithm of the cost, and I apologize for the ch change in notation. Y now means log cost rather than cost. So we look at the change from year to year, from t plus 1 to t, in the logarithm of the cost. And we assume that that's given by some drift term. It's the same mu I showed you in the earlier slides. It's the rate at which costs are dropping. And then there's some random noise around that. It's actually, we're going to make it a random walk. So there is some noise in T that's accumulating. And there's some noise amplitude K that determines how noisy that random walk is. Or, or, and then similarly, it turns out we can rewrite Wright's Law in a similar way. I won't, I won't um, go into how we do that because uh, it's a bit of a mathematical detail. Now, the nice thing about doing this to go back to these formulas, is now we, we're going to think about all the technologies the same way. We're going to make a bold hypothesis, which is that all technologies follow this. It's just a question of what mu is and what k is. So mu and k are now technology-specific parameters that will assume actually stay constant in time throughout the history of that technology. So the nice thing about this is it allows us to collapse all the data, use the law of large numbers, uh, using the trick that Gauss discovered a couple of centuries ago now, and um, collapse all the data in one distribution, because basically we, <coughs> um, we fit these constants, we divide by the constants to normalize all the time series in the same way, and then we can collapse everything, all 50 technologies, onto one distribution, and then we can test things in that vein to see what works. Now, as you know, you might remember from elementary statistics, if you have a Gaussian process you, you, and you uh, look at the empirical distribution where you're, you're forced to measure the means and standard deviations, you get a student distribution. Now, so how well does, does this work? Well, we could derive some formula, and this is where we had to work hard, um, because if you think about this, the errors are going to be growing in time. That is, if you're forecasting one year out, it's going to be a lot easier than forecasting 20 years out. And under this kind of process, in fact, that's what you expect. Even if you knew the parameters perfectly, because this is a random walk, the, the error envelope is effectively going to go at the square root because this is a diffusion process. So you would expect to see the, the error growing as a square root of time or the squared error to grow linearly in time. And indeed, we can derive that in our model, so we see this number tau in that formula up above, which is a formula for the expected error. That's, and the error is now this 
E, this squiggly E, which is the difference between the forecast made with that simple Moore's Law model and what actually happened. So it's the difference between these two things. So we, we take that number, we divide it by the estimated standard deviation of the process. That's how, how noisy was the curve. Um, we square that, we take the average of the errors, our hypothesis, well, which we derive under this, uh, the assumption of that process I showed you, is that this grows now um, linearly with tau, that's the horizon, that's the time horizon into the future, plus there's another term which is tau squared over m. Now m is the number of data points that you have to make the fit. As you have more data points, remember we're assuming a stationary process here, um, as you have more data points, the fit gets better, and so your model should get better. But what happens is with finite m, there's always some error, which means that there's a, this tau squared over m term corresponds to the fact that that error asymptotically always dominates because tau squared is asymptotically bigger than tau. It starts out smaller because m is typically a number, like in the experiments we did, because we had a short data set, we only had about 5,000 data points, we, um, we, we, had, we actually took intentionally m to be small. We took m to be five. So we just used the five last data points, the five last years, and then we forecast up to 20 years into the future using just that data. And, but so what happens is initially the tau term dominates and later on the tau squared over m term always dominates. So we make a very specific hypothesis about the functional form of how accurate, how accurate our prediction should be. And when we compare this, quantity here, you see the dots are what we actually observed over about 5,000 different forecasts. The, this dashed line here is what we observed from the simple random walk without drift. And this solid line here is what we get when we extend the process to allow for, for autocorrelation between the data points. So in other words, if a technology is improving a lot in one year, it's likely to improve a lot the next year too, and vice versa. This effectively decreases the amount of data and makes your forecast worse. So what you can see is our theory fits the data pretty well. And to test this in another way, we actually look at the student distribution. So the student distribution is here plotted on semi-log scale. So we plot the positive side here and the negative side over here. And and we compare the um, simple model without the correlation, which is here, to the errors we get with the model with the correlation there. And the basic punchline is, okay, we've got some fluctuations away from the student distribution, but the forecasts are not too bad. And actually, we can do tests and show that, in fact, they're pretty good. Now, now, now we can actually use this stuff. To come back to my question about solar energy, um, this is our distributional forecast for solar energy based on that time series up above. We forecast that this is roughly the zone where we'll stay within one standard deviation. The, the light gray is the zone where you're within two standard deviations. That is the 95% quantile. And so you can then just see that the odds that by the time you get to 2030 that solar energy will not have dropped in cost are not zero. There are a few percent based on our historical experience using lots and lots of technologies. Um, now, we can do this with any technology. The differences between these technologies turn out to be in, that as this parameter mu gets um, smaller, the data get noisier and noisier. Um, so, all right. Now, just as a by the way, um, we happen to look at the actual usage of different energy sources, and um, we were triggered in some sense by the International Energy Association, who's recently updated their forecast. They used to say 11%, now they say 16% of electricity could be generated by solar energy in 2050. So that's a point that's way out here somewhere. In contrast, this is the actual data for solar energy compared with other energy producing technologies, and you can see that um, while on the other hand it starts out very low because the rate of deployment has been the order of 45% per year throughout the history, if you just extrapolate that curve, 
the, the, the point where you might hit 20% of primary energy, which might be a reasonable number because that's probably as far as you can go without better progress on storage, um, that happens in 2027. So that's actually good news for climate change. And by the way, it's a little hard to see how the IEA could forecast 16% or previously 11 And In fact, if you go back through their forecasts, they've systematically always forecast much lower. They've been steadily updating their forecast over the last couple of decades from a minuscule number to these numbers. Now, um, we, we can also do the same thing for rights law. That's actually important because countries like Germany have tried to encourage adoption of uh, of energy technologies, green energy technologies, through things called feed-in tariffs, which basically amount to intentionally stimulating production to try and accelerate the rate of progress. And um, so one of the things we can do with this is estimate what the effect of those kind of tariffs will do. And we've been working on that. Let me just make say one other thing. Um, there's, there's a cause-effect uh, uh, question with something like introducing a feed-in tariff. That is, is it the case that we see rights law because increasing production drives costs down, or is it that innovation drives costs down, which increases demand? So what's the cause and effect relation? And in a paper that, well, we haven't gotten done yet, but we, we actually got a huge data set for World War II technologies, American uh, production of military materials during World War II. And um, it's a great natural experiment because we know that it isn't the case that Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1939 said, well, you know, tanks are getting really cheap. Let's build a lot of them. Uh, quite the opposite. America had the 17th largest military in 1939. And Roosevelt ordered all the manufacturers of the United States to begin producing war material. Um, uh, essentially, uh, for example, he famously told you know, the car makers, that, that he told them what he expected them to do. And they said, but Mr. President, we won't be able to make any commercial cars. He says, gentlemen, do not misunderstand me. You're not going to make commercial cars. <laughs> You're going to make tanks. Anyway, so it's a great natural experiment. And indeed, we find that increasing the scale does actually bring costs down. Now, I want to end my talk changing the subject a little bit to go back to the sort of lofty stuff I talked to you at the beginning about um, ecologies of technologies and ways to think about that. So this is a sort of a first step. Um, this is an example of the generalized usefulness of ecosystems thinking, which uh, can be applied to lots of things. I give a list here. Uh, and I've got another paper here that anybody's interested in financial markets that applies this kind of thinking to financial strategies. But what I'm going to talk about here is production networks in the economy. Production networks are pretty complicated for a mod in the modern economy. This is the supply chain of a laptop computer, which, as you can see, is um, not only complicated but geographically distributed. It's a kind of a strange a developmental process where imagine, you know, imagine if you try to assemble a baby by making the parts all over the world and shipping them all to some spot and assembling them. Uh, uh, but that's how we do technologies now. Um, the theory I'm going to present to you very briefly, because I, I don't want to go over time because I'd like to leave a little time for questions, <coughs> is based on uh, the the an old theory by Leontief. Uh, it's a beautiful theory. Uh, it doesn't get the attention it deserves in economics now. Uh, but basically, it treats the physical production system as a network of inputs and outputs based on the physical flow of materials. And so the nodes are industries. Each produce a single good. Their weighted directed links are the inputs to each industry. And you can base this on either physical flows or on the monetary flows. There's a precise analogy to equilibrium chemical kinetics. And you can, if you make equilibrium assumptions and you apply conservation laws, which are things like the money flowing into node, one node equals the money flowing out of that node, you can write down a linear system equations. And these kind of things have been used since the 50s. In fact, this theory is what stimulated the whole concept of national accounting that we now rely on for things like GDP measurement and so on. Um, now, we're going to use this in a pretty different way. That is, we want to think about a kind of 
very primitive evolutionary model where, and we want to compare two different kinds of economies. One is a flat economy where industries S1 and S2 both produce a final good and just compete with each other. And the other is a chain economy where industry S1 produces an intermediate good, which is used by industry S2, which then is the final good. And what I'm going to argue from this theory is that if, if locally each industry is improving at some rate, this economy, will prices will drop faster and, and good, goods production will become more efficient in this economy than this economy. And the idea is that this industry makes an improvement, that improvement gets passed on to industry S2, it makes it in its improvement, so the final improvement is actually the product of the improvements that the two industries made. And you can see this with something like a laptop. If, um, you know, if, if the chips improve, then that's passed on automatically to the laptop, then they do something else about the actual laptop. You, you get both of those. Now, so how do we do this? We, we first of all, assume a simple local process for technological improvement, um, and then we look at, well, we make these predictions that I, I say here, which I'll come back to. So what's our model for improvement? It's simple input tuning. So it's a very naive model. It's, it's, I list here one of many factors that go into actually making improvements, but because we, we can't make most of these easily tractable, we just tackle the very first one up there, which I call, we call input tuning. Meaning, well, I'll give you a concrete example. I, I, um, I, I own a sailboat. I used to own another sailboat before it sank in Cuba. And um, that's a long story. Um, but this boat was a uh, fiberglass-hulled sailboat built in 1965. And in 1965, they still didn't understand just how strong fiberglass was. So one of the things I liked about this boat, I mean, that hull was really strong. I actually tested it once by hitting a rock at full speed and, uh, you know, it was scratched a little bit but hardly damaged. That wasn't what actually sank the boat. Um, but, but, you know, since then, sailboats, the hulls have simply become lighter because they realized that they didn't need to put that much fiberglass in. And, um, and actually they got faster when they became, when they did that because they got lighter. And so that's input tuning. You just, you just somehow realize you don't need as much of that stuff as you used to. And it could be a proxy for other things like finding new materials that are cheaper or better. But we just assume it's a simple input tuning model. Now, so then we plug that into, and I'll just flash these equations for purely gestalt purposes. You have some linear equations at the top for the physical process. Um, the equation in the middle allows you to compute prices from this Leontief approximation. And the third equation allows you to compute statements about physical inputs to a statement about prices. So, so we take that, we make the assumption that the physical network is somehow getting more efficient. So if you look at the, the normalized, if you take industry I and you look at its inputs from industry J, then you assume that the, that's just going to decrease due to input tuning at some rate given by some constant gamma i that's specific to industry i times gamma ij. So in other words, we're assuming an exponential improvement in that industry through time. So this connects up a little bit with uh, what I said before. And um, uh, so we just kind of turn the mathematical crank and go through this the equations, and I'm not going to bore you with this, but we end up deriving some very simple relationships between prices, GDP, the, the rate of improvement of GDP, and the topological structure of the production network. And so we applied this to some data from the World Input Output Database. <clears throat> we first of all can now back out rates of improvement of industries because you, you have from the earlier statement I made, you should have realized that if you think about a given industry, you could say, well, what, what improvement is Apple actually making on this computer getting better versus what improvement did Motorola make in making the chip cheaper? So you have to factor those things out to even think about specific industries. You can see there's a huge variation in the rate of improvement of industries ranging from minus 60% to 60%. Roughly, it turns out, fits a student distribution. Um, 
We also were able to prove some simple theorems, like we can prove that there is a quantity which uh, could be called a generalized output multiplier. In an ecological term, it has to do with how deep the, the, the production network is. So it's like your position on the food web. We can show that if you take a given country, then it, it, or a given closed economy, that the ratio of gross output to net output is equal to the depth, the, the, the uh, depth of the economy. And so we can show that it, this is invariant under aggregation. I'm going to skip that slide because in, in the interest of time. And then we can make some homogeneity assumptions. So we say, well, what, what if all industries were improving at the same rate? Now, that's not at all true. But what if we assume that? Then we can at least look at the all else equal what effect is this trophic depth or this aggregate output multiplier that says how deep the economy is or how high the trophic level of an industry is? How does that relate to the rate of growth of GDP or the rate at which um, price indices for given industries drop? Now, to give you a little better, I, I probably snowed you with this last bit, but um, let's just, just to show you that this, what the idea is, we're going to compare the economy of the U.S. and China. This is just which industry we're talking about. The y-axis contains the trophic level of the industry. And the trophic level here you should think of as the mean number of times a dollar changes hand before it reaches a household. So if you're in a business, um, <coughs> let's say take that COK, which is nuclear fuel and oil, basically. Um, uh, fuel for producing energy. Um, if you're in that business, the number of times a dollar changes hands typically before it actually goes to a worker is about three and a half. So that's what the depth means. Now, so right away, and now, now each dot here is an industry. The size of the dot is the weight of that industry and the GDP of the country. And you can see that these two graphs for China and the US look really different. First of all, China has much deeper trophic levels on average for its industries. Just look at the scale. Secondly, China, the industries at the top are, and the big ones, are things like electrical and optical manufacture, ELC, TPT transportation, rubber, chemistry, metallurgy. Um, the US, in contrast, the high winds are small. Uh, and you know the biggest high wind is real estate up there. Um, this is like uh, public administration. Well, not that public administration. This is essentially miscellaneous. But these are all service industries down at the bottom. Finance sort of sitting uh, partway up the chain. It's a very different kind of economy. Agriculture is interesting. Agriculture in the US is a very high trophic level industry. Agriculture in China is one of the lowest trophic level industries corresponding to the difference in the way these happen. Now, we can then plot growth rates against trophic depth, and we see we see a strong positive relationship. And actually, we can show this performs better than standard, um, standard growth models. Um, it turns out the developed countries typically sit in, the, in these, these clusters where they have fairly um, a low trophic depth and high GDP per capita. Now, I'm going to flip through these. Let me just make one more statement. We hypothesize that a typical uh, developed country has gone through uh, a trajectory where the trophic depth of the country, that's this aggregate out output multiplier, first goes up and then goes down as they enter the service economy. And so we've been looking at these trajectories through time. Now, um, these key points summarize my talk. I want to just end on a couple of brief philosophical notes. Um, so first of all, go back to that, uh, if you think about that laptop slide, the technological ecology is extremely autopoetic. What do I mean by that? That all its components depend on each other to exist. And if you somehow collapsed it, it would be incredibly hard to start it again. Um, just imagine uh, if all technology disappeared, even if you understood, even if the knowledge was still around, what would it take to get it going again? You would have to go through a sequence of steps. You know, you have to go back to those guys with their scrapers, build your first primitive tools, smelt some metal. It, it'd be a very long road to get back to where we are now. Um, um, 
Okay, this is my central point that I think, though I, I, I mean, I've only given you hints of it, I think there exists an interesting evolutionary theory for technological change. And I wanted to, and oh darn it, I got, didn't get the slide I thought I had here. Well, okay, I had thrown in a slide about robots, because I, 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 given that this, this is about, um, uh, this conference is about AI, um, we use the same stuff we use to look at fo solar photovoltaic cells to look at robots. And we benchmarked it against various things, and the result was interesting. What we ended up seeing is that the cost of robots has been coming down at around 5% per year for around two decades. Um, the quality of robots has been going up at about 5% per year for those same two decades. And this is pretty robust across several data sets. So, in other words, robots in that histogram I made sit at about 10%. And you can then ask, how does that compare to human labor? Well, if you assume that human labor in, say, the United States in a manufacturing job makes around 20 bucks an hour, uh, we're at the point now where we're at break even with robots. So it does suggest we are at a critical point regarding robotics, where robotics is, I think, set to enter the mainstream, which presents some rather profound challenges. Um, and I think on that note, I'll end my talk. Thank you. Um, I would expect in all the pictures that at one point, the cost of the raw material or the availability of raw material should come into play. Yeah. So this is a very common question, and it's a, a question that's been investigated in the literature. I didn't say that R Wright, after he wrote his original 1936 paper, and in, in the 50s somewhere, the business school guys picked up on this, and there's probably a couple hundred papers written applying his law to various things. And there are papers hypothesizing floors, as you mentioned. But I've, I mean, I've looked at a lot of data and seen very little evidence for them. and. Um, and I, I think the reason is that we're talking about cost. Cost is a funny thing. Cost has to do with things like the way you produce stuff and learning, and it doesn't have physical limits on it. So unlike Moore's Law, well, the original Moore's Law is hitting a wall, as we know right now. And so I don't, you know, we're not going to see transistor density doubling anymore. But costs seem to kind of keep doing what they're doing. Interesting question. Everybody has that question, but the data for it is, the data doesn't support it so far. Yeah, it seemed early on in the graph of the energy costs that at least up to a certain point, you could have predicted a similar outcome with nuclear energy until it hit a sort of upper, upper plateau. Is it, isn't there, you know, as with the previous question, you know, as, as with even solar, the perfect organization of material that captures near 100% of solar energy isn't then the upper bound, whatever the cost yeah. of that So again, is. distinguish cost from efficiency. So, so I could have another plot of efficiency of solar modules. It's in general gone up, but it hasn't changed dramatically in a while, actually. It's, it's around, you know, there's a 20% seems you can get to pretty easily, and getting above that's harder, although some of the technologies have higher efficiencies. But efficiency is not generally the limiting factor. The limiting factor is what it costs to produce it. And that's not affected by efficiency. That's, that's you know, and in fact, I think <clears throat> a lot of the progress we're gonna see is actually in lower performance solar cells that can be applied in very easy ways, like just painting them onto a roof. You somehow paint the roof and you, you know, you have, you collect the electricity off the roof just from the paint. Um, people are talking about doing this thing with things like roads, having roads be big solar collectors. So roads, roof buildings, etc. cetera. Um, but back to nuclear power, I mean, this, this again, this is a cost and there's no... Uh, it was on the, on the later slides where you were mapping the different costs. The, Okay, well, I don't think I have a later one for nuclear power, though. Or, yeah, I don't think I have a later one for nuclear power, and it, and it hasn't gone down. And, and, you know, and what you see when you look at these technologies that haven't decreased in cost, like 
oil. I mean, oil now costs about what it did in 1890, once you adjust for inflation. And um, you just see kind of noisy, noisy behavior when you look at those. So there's some special set of technologies that are the improving technologies, and those are the technologies, I would argue, that the economy is rewiring itself toward. So you take, say, computer technologies, you know, semiconductor chips. Photography used to be an industry that was about chemistry. Chemistry in this histogram has one of the low rates of improvement. And um, so the chemicals are down in here somewhere. It's rewired itself over here. So now it's an industry about silicon. All right. I, Thank I you. think we'll break here. Let's give him another, another <laughs> applause.